What's going on, everybody? This is Dr. Chris Featherstone here for yet another episode of Unscripted. Listen, it's Tuesday night. You know what that means. I have some of the biggest, the baddest, the best wrestlers today of today and yesteryear. And tonight is no different, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, this one's a uh, a comeback. This one's a return. We don't have too many returns on Unscripted. And if you're a return, that means that either me and or the fans really, really liked you. And this person applies for uh, both, both categories. Uh, this guy, you know, it's funny, man. I, I've, I've uh, people really spend time to know who I am. I really a lot of, I put, I put a lot of people over. That's, that's what I was supposed to do as a journalist. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've written for Sports Illustrated. I've written for Fox Sports. I've been doing this journalism game for 10 years now, over 10 years. And I've interviewed over 300 wrestlers. Uh, I think I'm at 16 or 17 WWE Hall of Famers. I've uh, I've grown relationships with a lot of people in the pro wrestling industry, and there's a lot of and there's there's but you know all, all, out of all the relationships that I've built, there's a small pocket of people. That I'm like, you know what? When I think of this person, yeah, I remember interviewing that person. Yeah, I remember interviewing that person. Cool guy, cool guy. There's just a small pocket of people who I'm like, oh yeah, that's that one. Yeah, that that one's a, a real one right there. That's one of my favorite people to interview. There's only a small p- pocket of that. This guy, you know, always liked him when he was uh, in WCW, uh, and you know, legacy with his dad being a, a one of the most popular promoters in pro wrestling history had a big shoes to fill and he did <laughs> he, he, he did and he did a great great job at it and this guy not only from a wrestling standpoint he's just a nice dude man he's just a cool guy and uh, as, he, as you know Manny Fernand- Man- Manny Fernandez was supposed to be on the show tonight and man just this guy just came through and I appreciate just good-hearted people like that. He's a pro wrestler. He's in the pro wrestling. He's a one of the very known, very popular pro wrestler. He he's someone who's uh, who's created a his carved his own legacy in the business. And out of all the things that he does throughout the day and throughout the night, he was like, you know what? I'll help my guy out, and I'll come through. And I'll do the hot tag. Ladies and gentlemen, he is Eric Watts. How are you, cowboy? Man, man, with that introduction, I was waiting. I was like, who does he have on tonight? This guy sounds pretty cool. <laughs> I was like, he's over. <laughs> hey, nice. hey, I'll be back whenever you want. You want to intro me like that ever again? I dare you. I double dog dare you. Oh, my goodness. Woo. Nice. I meant what I said, yeah. man. I meant what man. I said. Yeah, Absolutely, listen, man. hot tags have to happen. And uh, uh, when I got the call, you know, um, it was a, a mutual friend of ours. And, um, you know, I had things going on. And I'm like, who? He said, Doc, Doc Featherstone. I said, oh, man, I did something with him, you know, a mm-hmm. little while back. And then you, you brought it back up. It was May. It was, you know, yeah. as, as you can say about interviewing people in all different sports and pro wrestling and whatever i i can honestly tell you as many podcasts as i've done mm-hmm. um i remember the podcast and, and and as you said it's a small pocket mm-hmm. and as soon as your name came up i just started smiling and i and i loved it when you sent me uh the link because i so remember the first time you sent me the leak and I know, I know you got to make it generic or whatever, but and, and in this industry, it's, it's kind of, it, it's nice to see what you do, but Hey, it is a family show. Please no cussing. And as soon as I said, I said, I don't think I cussed on his last podcast. You, you know, like it had, it had me nervous, right? Because <laughs> one thing about pro wrestling, I know guys that never cursed before they were in pro wrestling. And one of the toughest things to stop doing when you get out of pro wrestling is cursing, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and and so there was this time, um, this guy had been in, he'd probably been about seven, eight months. And you know, this was, I mean, he, he was just known as, as, you know, didn't drink, no drugs, uh, uh, phenomenal athlete, 
but but he had his faith right and he you know he, he didn't he didn't he wouldn't go out late it's training eating the whole thing about seven eight months in man wcw next day. so i'm gonna take you in the corner and like i'm gonna bleep 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 and i'm gonna bleep <laughs> I, pulled, I pulled him aside i said let me ask you something man what changed he goes well how do you tell someone you're gonna kick their butt if you're not talking about kicking their butt he goes so you know and 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 it just clicked to me and i laughed it's not it's not funny you know because yeah. it's a horrible habit right you, you know you were raised as i was right mm-hmm. the, only, the only reason why you cuff is because you don't have a good vocabulary yeah right you you know you know you know the parents right you, yep. you just don't have a you don't have an understanding yep. for the english language therefore yep. there's so many words you yep. don't have to use those right but then i started thinking about it and it kind of cracked me up because my dad Right, so he's wrestling, he's doing his thing, and and um, when, when when he dedicated his life, now he he was he was saved, he was saved way when he was a kid, mm-hmm. but you know when I was raised around him, I didn't really see that side because he had he has his beliefs that you know he went through a whole struggle that you could lose your salvation if mm-hmm. you didn't live life right. So then mm-hmm. he got he got mad about things. Mm-hmm. So when he when he rededicated or however you want to say it Mm -hmm. his life back you know our house was very different Mm -hmm. very different you know from you know cowboy bill watts and then one day you know i I was older i was older and uh he i i was at a show and doing our normal stuff set things up and doing stuff and man he was talking to someone in the back and (laughs) uh Everything came right back to him. Yeah, you know, I want you to F and this and F and that. And da, da, da. You know, I was like, oh my gosh. And so my dad came out and he goes, man, I don't know if I can stick and come, come to these matches and do this, man. If I if I if I'm gonna rededicate myself, he goes, because how do you how do you get so emotional about a match? He's like, because all of a sudden you kind of are like you think you're in a street fight and yeah. and, and not at the person, and yeah. you're thinking you're also trying to translate in your head how so many people see it. Of course, not children, hopefully not yeah, children, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but, 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 you know, it's, it, it all of a sudden becomes a form of communication. Mm-hmm. And, and especially when you're going over a finish or whatever, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, it takes me back because uh, when my kids were growing up, I can't remember the hot PlayStation Grand Torino or something was, you know, some kind of game. Grand Theft and Auto, maybe. Grand Theft Auto. Mm-hmm. And so my kids like, I'm like, hey dad, I want to set this up. Let's set this up. And it has it, it had like parental stuff. Like yeah. where 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 they cursed or did I'm mm-hmm. like, that's crazy. So I'm like, okay, I want to hear <laughs> and now I gotta hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, then then I'm like, okay. No, we better we better cut this off. And a matter of fact, DDP, I, I, I was at his party. I wanted to ask him this. He, he has his Christmas party early, mm-hmm. so his Christmas party was Saturday. And uh, man, what a what a turnout! It's completely different from last year. Um, mm-hmm. uh, last year, I'd gone to see my dad, and 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 you know he he doesn't live real close. He's about ten hours away, mm-hmm. and with him aging, um, I wanted to go ahead and get my COVID test, even though I knew that I didn't have COVID, even though I stayed away from people like six, seven days, I couldn't imagine if I drove out to see my father that I hadn't mm-hmm. seen in like three mm-hmm. years and I brought down COVID, right? Yeah. So I, so I had gone to see my dad, came back last year from seeing my dad. I wasn't home for three days, but Dallas said, hey, bro, you got, you read it? COVID test, same day. I'm like, bro, I just got back. He goes, same time. i had to go find another COVID test and this is when COVID tests were hot like, uh-huh. like you could not get one of those same day one bro i was out all day the same day to go go to his thing but uh but doing his his yoga i remember when i was setting it up it actually it at in, in his yoga i can't remember what he called it he, like pc or or something you could choose on his yoga so that that uh that workouts where he may not say something, you know, not that he says huh. a lot, right? Huh. Not that he says a lot. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, it, it had a choice a, a long time ago, but I think he's got, man, he's got so many routines and so many things now. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, I don't think it's that option, but when he first started, I'd go back there and some of my funnest were Jake would be there. 
his office assistant, uh, Linda Leonard's in there. They're, they're in, they're in the, the living room of his house. The, the sweatpants that they had on, <laughs> the heart rate. Then you see Jake, he just fall to the floor. I can't do this. I, yeah. It's killing me, you know, like yeah. cutting promos. So, yeah, there was a little verbiage, I think, back then, you know? Yeah, yeah. Awesome, yeah. man. You ready to jump into these questions? Let's do it, baby. Awesome. Speaking of your dad... Yes. Guillermo was asking, was there any reason why your dad implemented the top rope diving moves and over the top rope disqualifications? Always, that's a good question, Guillermo. I always wondered that too. Right now, so if Guillermo's talking about when he, when, when my father, just so I can read the questions, too, um, if he's talking about when my father first got the WCW, yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, it, it, it seems like it happened yesterday because it caused a rift. Yeah. So my father gets to WCW, and and my father, the way he books, he believes he believes that you can be old school, mm -hmm. because then it would be new wrestling. <laughs> so there was a formula, or there was a how do you say this? There was a, pro a progression in wrestling, right? So if you had a first card person come out, those first card person. They didn't go out of the ring. They didn't come off the top row and they progressed. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and so my dad shows up at WCW and people are, you know, power bombing people and kicking out of uh, finishes. Yeah. And, and so he, he, he would say, listen, he, on TV, even he goes, listen, going off the top rope or doing flips. We got Scorpio. We got, to, we got people I need and I want doing it. A, it's part of their gimmick. B, B their mid card up. This is what I need. And it was so difficult for the guys to get it through their head because it was run like, just do what you want. And he's like, that's not how you build up a show. So we got to build up the show. So he sat there and said, no top rope. Well, guys kept on still messing up the top rope occasionally. That's when he took the mats off mm -hmm. the concrete. Oh, and when I, want to, when I want to tell you, he's like, I, I, will, I will teach them not to come off the top rope. And then the next thing was, was fines. So it had to do with trying to set up for the audience the progression so that every match wasn't a train wreck. Every person wasn't kicking out of someone's finish. You know, he made everything very, like, you, you didn't use someone else's finish. Man, I, I remember when he laid down the law, uh, baby faces and heels couldn't even ride to towns together. Yeah, they, they, they even went back to making sure that they put heels and baby faces on different planes. And yeah. that's not easy to do. Yeah. That's not easy to do. And it didn't make people happy because, you know, you're supposed to go on the plane that they sent you on, but let's say you knew you could get away from getting out of there at 1 PM and you'd still be okay. Cause the golden rule was don't ever take the last flight. So mm -hmm. the three o'clock could get you there, take the one o'clock. Mm -hmm. Well, if WCW sent you a ticket and it was 7 AM. Now you're sitting there going, uh, but I could take two other flights. So now you got to find so now you got to find out what the heels taken and then you got to hope that they don't have the same idea but here's the problem. God forbid that you're messing around with your tickets and then you got a road manager or a referee mm -hmm. or a fan that sees you and now you're both fined. Mm -hmm. he, he he even split up the locker rooms again. Yeah. So babies and heel weren't in the same locker room. So um he was taking it back but but you know, talk, I did talk to my dad about this, and this is recently. And he said, you know, Eric, I did it for multiple reasons. The other reason was I wanted to bring back the, authentic, uh, the, the, uh, the authenticity of, of real wrestling to the mindset of the wrestlers. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when I was there, there was a lot of guys, young guys that didn't come from watching wrestling, Van Hammer, uh, Johnny B. Bad, uh, um, you know, you could, you could go down the great looking specimens, uh, Mark Bagwell. These guys were no more wrestling fans. <laughs> you know, they were guys that were in the gym that heard, you know, that, that, that heard something about wrestling or you could make money in wrestling or or one to be a local celebrity and starting an indie rep. That's what so they didn't know. They didn't go back to the lion's den in Canada. Mm -hmm. They didn't go back, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they didn't see the Von Erics. They didn't yeah. see, you know, so that- that's Vern, Gagne. Vern, <laughs> the Vern Gagne. Vern I mean, the crowbars, <laughs> and, you know, like, like a Lex Luger, I think 
why he had so much respect, believe it or not, for the business is he was down in Tampa with Hiro Matsuda. Ooh, okay. You know, <laughs> and yeah. I remember, I remember the first time I met Hiro Matsuda. My dad had gotten a call um, um, from 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 Eddie Graham, and Eddie Graham, Vern Gagne, and Eddie Graham are two pillars in my dad's life of, of mm-hmm. him getting in the business, right? And so, so my dad had his territory was rocking and rolling. Um, uh, Eddie calls up and said, "Hey, we're hurting a little bit. Is there any way you can come in and help book for?" You know, because my dad was an incredible booker. I remember, boom, took us out of our school. <laughs> we were driving in a U-Haul to Tampa, brother. But we get an apartment, we're put in schools, and we're going. And so uh, my dad's like, hey, you know, to you know, to, to, to amateur wrestling and everything like this, I'm going to take you down to a dojo. I want you to meet someone. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember how old I was, seven, eight years old. And uh, this hero Matsuda, I go, hello, sir. I went to shake his hand. He slapped me all, almost uh, unconscious, right? And, and I had tears coming to my eye. Like, he goes, he goes, yeah, we got a lot of work if you're going to cry over a little slap. I mean, that's how I met the man. Oh, wow. How I met the man. Great wow. story, though. Great story because um, he taught me so much. I mean, I'm not just talking about wrestling. He taught me so much. When I was in WCW, this man actually traveled from Tampa and came down to Jody Hamilton School, which was the pre-power plant, but it became the power plant. Yeah. To work out with me. Wow. And we and we and we and we and we started out like we always started out. We started out with a thousand Hindu squats, and then we did push-ups before we even we even wrestled. And um, it, it almost brought me to tears, man. When I saw him, he goes, "It's time to train." It was like it was all like Mr. Miyagi come out of nowhere, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was the it was the coolest deepest thing, but to Guillermo, that that's what it was. It was it was a it was nothing more than bringing it back for the fans, but also setting a tone and bringing it back for the wrestlers too. Mm-hmm. And it, and it was beautiful because it caused a lot of controversy and a lot of conversation. Mm-hmm. And then after people finally figured out it was going to be that way, and once everyone understood that he would start allowing things again, I think the conversation helped because people were like so so. So why would he even do that? Mm-hmm. I mean, guys in the business, and then and then, well, you say that in front of a Sting or a Steiner or a Hogan or a or a, a Macho Man. You say it, and and they'll sit you down and go, "Okay, son, let me tell you a story. <laughs> let me tell you where I came from. Let, let me mm-hmm. tell you how we used to train. Let me tell you about pro wrestling." So mm-hmm. it was it was uh it was brutal for the guys. It caused a lot of a lot of chaos in the locker rooms. A lot of people yelled until they found out that. No one was listening to him, and and then a whole bunch of uh, uh, a good came from it. Very nice. Marito's asking, what inspired you to be involved in wrestling, and what were three favorite matches you had in your career? Okay, so what inspired me was, you know, I grew up in a family that, and I'll make this as short as possible. My mom's an entrepreneur. My dad's an entrepreneur, right? And so my mom believed that all things are possible. Uh, that that the difference between a dream and a goal is a deadline. You want a mansion? That's a dream. You want a mansion in 10 years? That's a goal. You want to go, you know, and, 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 and that's just, and that's how she rolled, period. So within, within that, you know, during the summers and the weekends, um, when there's no school or no sports or whatever, we were on the road doing business, right? Because it was a business. You know, it wasn't entertainment to us. It was business. It, yeah. It's how we, it's how we got fed. And if we didn't, if we didn't do good, then we didn't eat, right? Mm-hmm. So, with that being said, my mother, she came over from Estonia, and 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 I don't know if you know, but had to escape her country. Was in concentration camp for seven years. Then her and her family were brought over, sponsored by a church in Oklahoma City. My dad at Oklahoma, they both went to the same high school. So what ended up happening is my dad left early from University of Oklahoma to go to the Oilers, okay? He knocked out the coach at the Oilers, and that's how he got transferred to Minnesota Vikings, and that's how Ganya got a hold of him. He had heard about a, a, a tough guy that also amateur wrestler at Oklahoma and all this other stuff up in Minnesota, and he went to recruit him out of pro football. Hmm. My, so he never got his degree. My mom never went to college. So she saw such good friends, the, you know, Dusty Rhodes, the Von Ericks, the Ganyas, mm-hmm. the Grams. And she goes, what, what do you see, Bill? 
none of these people, and, and I don't know who does and doesn't, but the majority have done, don't have a college education. They have nothing to fall back. If, if, if this territory goes away or something goes away, these kids need to have an education. Mm-hmm. That's, that, that, so we weren't, I was not allowed to be in the ring, to learn how to wrestle, to do anything until I got a college degree. So I was going to go to the draft. I knew where I was going to go, but I was kind of burnt out in football a little bit. And so I called and said, hey, Dad, do you know someone in Atlanta that I could just get in the ring and roll around with? I just want to see what it's like. And he said, yeah, Jody Hamilton. So it was something that I wanted to do. Did I know I was going to jump right into it? No, not until Dusty Rhodes and some other things. People listen to the podcast. So, so that's what took me into pro wrestling. I always loved it. I was part of it. And then when I actually got a taste of it, it was over. Mm. It, it, it was over. I had gotten bitten by a vampire. <laughs> there, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there was no blood. No, I was a vampire. I was done. Um, three best matches, man. I, I, I got to be honest uh, with you on when it comes to three best matches. It's scary because... I was such a fan of wrestling as well as trying to be the best I could be for the fans and for mm-hmm. wrestling um, that some of my favorite matches had to do with Steamboat or, or, or Austin. And it had, some of it had to do with just being in the ring and on a tag and just watching things go so smoothly. Right. Mm-hmm. It was, it was one of my favorites is Stone Cold, and it, it was it was not in, in, in he was of the Hollywood Blondes at the time, and I was newer there, and uh, I was told to go over, right, and 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 then all of a sudden, you know, Steve said no, I I, I didn't know about it, I heard about it as he walked out, Grizzly Smith, he said no, I'm not doing that, I'm not putting him over, and, and which is which is unbelievable for a person to do that, even in his career, right? He's not Stone Cold Steve Austin yet. You're telling the office, no, I won't do it. It doesn't matter who it is, Eric Watts, whatever. You do what the office says. Mm -hmm. But he believed in himself. He believed it was wrong. So he came up to me and he goes, kid, it's nothing against you. (laughs) I'm like, bro, it's okay. Beat me right in the middle. I, you know, listen, I'm, you know, look, look, I'm, I'm here to, to get along because I want to make this a career and, and, and I know you, you know, you're, go, you, you're, you're somebody now, but you're going to be somebody. And, and all I'm really here to do is to learn and, and, and be the best I can be. Mm-hmm. And instead he goes, no, that's not the way we're going to do it. We're going 20 minutes. And we're going to go Broadway. So, so now my mind just exploded. Cause I'm thinking to myself, Hey, I'm just coming in. I do understand why he thought that it wasn't the time to be putting me over yet. It was a crazy play on his that Mm -hmm. didn't hurt him, but could have hurt him, you know? So bravo, anyone that believes in himself that much, bravo. And then to then turn right around though and prove it. He proved it by saying, you aren't the issue. I just had to make a stand up. You, you became part of the issue, but I had to make a stand. So, but what we're going to do, we're going to go out and dance for 20 minutes. Mm. And that was one of my favorite matches because um, two or three things happened. Uh, fans had come. Uh, so the sheets had gotten out. People that don't know, I mean, I think all your people know what smart sheets are. So now the sheet riders are trying to bury me. And, and they're bringing posters that say stuff. They're placing them on the front row so fans are on me. And there was a group of guys that were incredible hecklers incredible hecklers and they were on me and and i was i was just out there to prove to people so steve we're going going and steve goes at a pace like no one else matter of fact the only person i've ever been in the ring with that kept a pace up like um steve ricky the dragon steamboat could but but what i'm trying to say is his pace was bar none the fastest mm-hmm. The, uh, the, the the second one was uh, fry, uh, Flying Brian Pillman. Okay. Too big. So now he's going. Now I'm trying to keep my breath. I mean, like I thought, okay, is he ribbing me? Is he trying to burn me up? So in that, these guys are heckling me. You you know, you, you, you're you horrible. You suck. Da, da, da. You shouldn't be in the ring. And you sucked as a football player. I said, pull me out. 
So Steve threw me out, and 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 I went to the cage. I go, you guys can't stop me. I said, bro. I said I had six interceptions against Florida State. I own the record at Louisville for most interceptions. They popped. They laughed. They actually got on the internet and said we came to destroy him, and now he's one of our favorite wrestlers. And wow. we got back in the ring. So that one was a big one. So some steamboats. One were a big one. Rick Rude was a, a, a big one because. We we actually did um, we we actually went around on on a, a few trips like tours with the storyline. Hmm. Arn Arn Anderson, when he came up with the idea because he needed his knee operation, someone reminded me of this at at, at, at Dallas's party. That gas station altercation in Charlotte, right? And how the girl videotaped me. I was going to be off the pay per view, but the girl showed up with it. Amazing which I was actually going to be off because that was a weekend I was supposed to get married. <laughs> and then, mm. and then the, the thing did so big, they're like, nope, you got the pay-per-view, so we had to postpone it. I still got the napkins with the wrong date because we had to postpone it a week. <laughs> um, but, but then out of that, I can say bar none, one of the funnest matches or, or one that I'll remember for my lifetime is I was at TNA, and it was Sandman and Raven. Raven came up with something called the Clockwork Orange House of House Fun of match. Fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Never been in there. I had never got busted open. Well, I never was uh, in my career. I had been busted open, but I had never been put in a position to get juice on my for myself. Mm -hmm. Right. So that happened. We we are with redshirt security. That kid had all of like nine months. Mm -hmm. Ryan, he was like six seven, six eight, huge kid. Mm -hmm. um, we've got. Um, so it was Richard Security, the, the guy out of Canada, uh, fantastic. Uh, I'm trying to remember his name. So we got Eric we got, Young, uh, Robert. No, uh, no, Bobby no, 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 A one. Trained tra 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 a lot of people. He's at TNA. Oh, uh, uh, Demore Scott Demore. No, not Demore. Uh, not Demore. Man, um, but it's it, it, they were called the Richard Security, and okay. so it was Kevin Northcutt, this kid, and gosh, oh, uh, Triton. Got the Triton guy, Joey. Uh, oh, see. He was a part of the Red Star Security at TNA. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But he was So so anyway. So you're talking about those three guys have a rookie, Northcutt, which was a, is an excellent wrestler. This guy that trained a thousand people, but they'd not really done anything but run rough shots as Red Shirt Security. So mm -hmm. now they're in a formed match, and now you got Raven, Sandman, and me. And we sit down to, to plot it out with all of like six minutes just to Joey talk Legend. about it. Joey Legend. Okay. Joey Legend, man. And but hey, listen, fantastic wrestler. Fantastic yeah. wrestler. So so we put some stuff together like two seconds. And I go, Oh yeah, this is gonna be horrible. <laughs> like this is gonna this is gonna be really bad because you got Raven go, Well, like, why don't you come in? I want to do this. And Sam like, well. But I'd like to do this. And I'm sitting there going, I don't care what I do. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll go with it. And like, well, let's do this. Let's do this. So it, it was a mosh pit of nothing, actually. I think basically we said, I said, basically, I think what happened is you said, we're going to go out there and then we're going to, you know, get the best of you guys. And then you'll know when we want to, you to turn the heat and get the best of us. And then... We're gonna go outside and we're gonna handcuff Eric. We're gonna do a few things, and this is how we're gonna finish the match. I'm like, oh yeah, this has all the chemistry of being the worst match ever and <laughs> ever. And um, I gotta be honest with you on this deal. Everyone ended up juicing. Um, I've ne I had never bladed myself ever. So now I, Kevin Northcutt, I knew very well. But I'm like, I don't need this heat and back if I go out there because I don't want to do this and not get any or cut my whole forehead off. Mm -hmm. And no one knew this. I went to Northcutt and said, hey, bro, you have to get me in the corner. You have to blade me. He goes like, what? Are you kidding me? You know? I'm like, do it. And he's like, what? Are you sure? I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he actually did it for me the first time. Wow. After that, I did it a thousand times. But um, so we did this and the match came off absolutely incredible i mean there were reviews saying it was the best six man of the year there were some reviews that said it was the bloodiest match of the year which 
I don't know, you know, with all the blood that went on around that time, I don't know how, but it really got some phenomenal reviews. And not just that, in the back, from Jarrett's to, to AJ Styles to uh, uh, Jerry Lynn. I mean, you get Jerry Lynn to come up and talk to you, you know it's Bible. You know yeah. it's done. I, I, don't, I don't need anyone else's perspective on it, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and so from, from, from a standpoint of going in and just going, okay, this was thrown together last second, meaning the whole angle, the whole thing, and to come off the way it did, including Goldilocks. Goldilocks mm. was so nervous because they were going to um, they were going to handcuff my hand, mm. uh, and and she was scared that she would not have the key to get me undone. They actually took a pen key and stuck it in her back dress too. <laughs> and she was going, uh, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous. And mm. dude, uh, Ryan. This big boy hadn't hadn't been on a whole bunch of matches. And like I said, he's like six, seven, three hundred and ten pounds. Mm -hmm. If you go back, you'll see me on my knees and he's hitting me and I'm tr he's hitting me so hard. I'm, I'm trying to talk myself into uh, out of passing out. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's nailed me. He's nailed me. And that's why people said, oh, my gosh, you gave him a huge, you know, shot, mm -hmm. shot, money shot. Mm -hmm. Bro, I lifted him. I lifted him and not to hurt him. To slow him down because his adrenaline was pumping. <laughs> he was throwing, he was throwing bombs on me. I was like, dang, dang, yeah. So, so man, wow. uh, that match, the Austin match, um, th those are probably my most um, memorable uh, uh, matches. Put it that way. Cool. All right, we got a quick two minutes left. Uh, of course, we'll take the super chats uh, uh, before anything. Special shout out to Instagram wrestling historian asking how long did it take your dad to write his book, the cowboy and the cross. Thank you. I the lesson historian. I, I you, you guys will never know. Cause I'm going to have to call him and ask him. I, I've never asked that question. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know how to answer it. Uh, let's see a couple more real quick. Um, I heard you wrestle Chris Benoit on several house shows. What was it like working with him? James is asking. Uh, I don't know. Chill bumps. Mm. Just 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 chill bumps. The the most aggressive guy when he used to warm up, he would kick the wall like I thought he was gonna break center block. I'm like, oh you're so mad. He goes, I gotta get mad. When I go out there, I believe I can beat you. I can believe I can take your head off. I'm like, well, yeah, you're acting like it too. Wow. <laughs> and then later on later on, that's just the way he would prep for a match. He yeah. got so intense. And when I'm saying out there, you didn't feel a thing. All the way from him jumping off the top rope and landing on you. The consummate pro professional. The, such a sweetheart of a guy. I, I mean, I remember when I was at TCW training, he even came down to work out with me a few times. And his son would get in the ring with my son and they would play around. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I had some special times with Chris. And he was a very, very special person. Speaking on speaking on that, um, last questions for me, real quick. Uh, what do you what do you think about um, David as far as like, you know, he's just the son of uh, uh, of Chris, and uh, you know, but he's but he's being you know blacklisted. You know what I mean? Uh, basically from um, from WWE, essentially. You know what I mean? Because because of the stigma that comes with Chris, but I mean, what, what do you think about that? Do you think that WWE should blacklist David or should I give him a shot? Man. Should I give him a chance? Man. You, you know, Doc, let's think about this. You know, everyone in the world deserves a chance, right? right. I mean, we, we, you you and me could take the gloves off and not even talk about wrestling. We, we, we could bring up so many things that if we held people back, based on what their fathers or mothers did yeah. or generations of certain people did yeah. or, or right i mean you and me could get so you and me could get so deep into the fact that you would think that you me uh, people of republican democrat atheist or whatever mm -hmm. people will get together i truly believe most people get together and say everyone deserves their own chance at life mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but also, in the past, me being a business consultant, working with companies private are different than working with public uh, companies that are public. Mm -hmm. And 
And so I don't want to, I'm not going to give you my answer based on this. I do remember coaches and I remember CEOs uh, that would say, hey, I've got to do what's best for my company. For if I bring my company down, no one eats, right? Mm -hmm. So so, um, to me, um the easiest way for me to say this is anyone that wants to wrestle bad enough right if they want to make it they can make it there's so many different ways go to japan go to aew go to places that would take you in two seconds to show the other team that they should take you because let me tell you what you break the ice at any of these other federations that federation will open its door back. But where does it stand on getting rid of that, the Benoit situation? You know, yeah. man, it, what a tough call. I would, I would want to, I would want to think that I would say, forget about it. But I'm telling you right now, the way society is about anything and everything, I can't yeah. tell you. Sometimes I have conversations with, with business owners. I go, well, I don't even want to get in this conversation because they'll ask me a question. So, What's your stance on this? Well, thank goodness I'm not working for you right now because I, I don't want to tell you my stance. Mm-hmm. It's so it there is such craziness right now. People are 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 acting so different that um, something small like giving a guy a chance could totally blow up into a boycott. Yeah, very totally blow up into a boycott, or or then all of a sudden Vince would be supporting drugs or or yeah. murder, or, you know, yeah. and all this sh- sh- stuff. But I do believe that anyone that wants it needs to go out and fight for it and have it. It just might not be a WWE if that's mm-hmm. if Vince doesn't believe it should be. Yeah, very interesting. Well, let's uh, great discussion. Let the listeners know what you're up to nowadays, and you've got uh, a partnership with uh, our man Vinny Rue, right? You're going to be uh, part of uh, you guys. You got some uh, a pretty cool, cool project coming up. Yeah, so so what I'm doing right now, you know, um, I jumped out, I, I backed off a little bit of business consulting about nine months ago. I've been following, I, I've done some consulting in some uh, companies that do merchant processing, like credit cards and stuff like that. And so um, I, st- I started uh, my own credit card processing company. So that's, that's a company, it's part of Megawatts Ventures. Uh, Megawatts Ventures, I also got, you know, um, some, some other ventures going. Vince and I have known each other for quite some time, and I have had a plethora of people asking me to be on podcasts um, or to do a podcast. As a matter of fact, probably about 20 years ago, I had a podcast um, that, that a person helped out. He would ask me the questions, and we'd talk, and we'd interview people, and it was kind of cool, but it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right space. Vince has a platform, and I think what I'm trying to iron out and he's trying to iron out is – the mission of the podcast right because i i don't see myself just trying to randomly get on you know a different wrestler every week i mean there's so many good people right out there and 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 i couldn't even compete against you as far as you interviewing and your journalism side but i have got things that i like doing and i have topics that i like talking about and i've got a list of people that i want to interview hoping that they liked wrestling and, 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 and their trajectory in life was never wrestling, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you know, from, from Aaron Lewis of Stain to Dennis Rodman to, mm-hmm. I, I mean, there's a plethora of people that I either know um, or I think that I have people close enough to them to be able to talk to them and just be able to talk to them about anything and, and, um, and everything. And I think it'd be really cool, but you know, I'm gonna need Vince's um, focus and leadership. Yeah. Uh, on getting it down there because man I don't, I don't do anything to fail so i don't want to be a podcast just to say i'm a podcaster for sure um that sure. embarrass me that embarrass me and 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 people that get on to do podcasts or wrestling that don't take it serious it it, sh- it shouldn't it, it, it well yeah it reflects any, the, uh, yeah. it reflects in the audience too if you're not taking it serious your audience aren't going to take you serious so yeah right right so i think i think i got some good i think i got um a, a person, you know, we're going to work on it. I think I got a good mentor. I, got, I think I got good leadership. And I do know a few people in this world that I think, like one named Dr. Chris Featherstone, 
that if I needed some mentorship, boom, the gun show. But if I needed some mentorship, you you know, off camera, you you might be able to stone cold me a little bit, like you know, pull me around the ring and teach me a few things, right? I got you, man. I got you. All right. Sounds good, man. Well, Eric, it's a pleasure, man. You know, you can hit me hit me up anytime. You got my number. You got my Facebook uh, info, man. Just you know, hey, hit me up, man. Let's let's make this happen, man. Let's do this. Sounds good. Thanks so much, man. Eric, it's been a pleasure being on uh, you being on here tonight, and uh, hopefully we'll get you uh, back soon, man. Let's do it, my friend. All right. Good talking to you. Likewise. Have a good night. Yeah.